Hola, buenos días. Eh, es para nosotros, para la EXAN, un honor tener a Jack Herzog. Herzog y de Merón nos enseñaron ya hace bastantes años otro entendimiento de la arquitectura. Nos enseñaron cómo la arquitectura es una piel que se puede tatuar, eh, que puede funcionar en estratos, eh, que puede vivir. Una piel viva, casi como Semper, empezó contándonos eh, mucho tiempo antes. Eh, para nosotros es un gran placer y un gran honor tener a uno de los arquitectos más vivos que ha marcado ya nuestra ciudad con dos grandes edificios, uno de ellos en el mismo Paseo del Prado, donde Rafael Moneo ha hecho aquí presente, ha hecho tanta obra, un edificio enfrente del Museo del Prado y el museo más visitado de este país eh, después del propio Prado. Y recientemente otro trozo de nuestra ciudad, enseñándonos a construir ciudad, la ciudad del BBVA, en una parte de eh, urbanismo eh, completamente destrozado, pero vuelta a rehacer eh, por su propio estudio. Quiero darle las gracias a Luis Fernández Galeano, muy especialmente por otra magnífica contribución a las actividades de esta escuela, a la relación de esta escuela con el exterior, y le paso eh, la palabra a él. Muchas gracias, director. No, brevísimamente, solamente decir que eh, Jack Herzog, que hoy hablará en inglés, hoy hablará en inglés, sin embargo, ha venido a Madrid para exponer su biografía intelectual y artística en la Fundación March. Y lo hará esta tarde a las siete y media, a las siete y media en la Fundación March, que está en la calle Castelló. Y ha sido tan amable de, eh, de brindarse con ocasión de esta visita a Madrid para dar una conferencia a la escuela. Eh, y yo solo agradezco especialmente esta, esta generosidad que tiene con, con nuestra escuela. Pero al mismo tiempo os invito a todos los que lo deseéis a escucharle esta vez en castellano eh, en la Fundación March hablando de, de su biografía completa. Y nada más, gracias de nuevo Jack, es un placer y un honor tenerte aquí. Hola, um, como ya, la, ya lo dijo um, Luis, voy a hacer esta presentación en um, inglés, sencillamente por tener más experiencia en explicar los proyectos en inglés que en, en castellano. Uh, el, el castellano. Castellano para mí es la lengua más para hablar con la gente y discutir y charlar, mucho más que explicar un, un proyecto de arquitectura. Arquitectura. Tengo hasta más experiencia en inglés que en alemán o en francés, por eso um, espero que entienda uh, mi decisión. Pero quizás habrá la posibilidad de hablar de más, um, un poco de, de los proyectos, si les gusta, después de la presentación. No es muy largo, son cuatro proyectos y le doy el nombre Reuse a la presentación Um, porque um, veo un interés, un interés muy especial en encontrar soluciones en el mundo que existe, en formas, en materiales, en símbolos, y conectar cosas en el proyecto, el proyecto siendo casi un punto o una red de intersección de estas influencias, de estas cosas que existen, preexisten en nuestro mundo. I begin with um, structures, transforming structures. Um, whenever an architect, can I have less? Like this. Whenever you as an architect, you start a project, Um, mostly something exists, All, almost always something exists. Um, you don't live in a world with no precedence, you don't world, live in a world with no givens. Uh, architecture is made by people for people. Um, this is, of, of course, especially obvious when you um, work on an existing, on a pre-existing structure. Um, 
certainly one of our most um, typical examples for this fact is Tate Modern. But also, for instance, uh, the Caixa Forum that was mentioned before in Madrid. This is how Tate was looking when we first saw it. It was like a hidden castle. It was at the same time monumental and made to be seen with, a fa with this huge chimney which lies right in front of St. Paul's Cathedral. As much as it is a hidden away kind of a castle which tries to keep everybody away from the building. So a kind of a paradox. You can see here that, um, that the architect of Tate Modern, Sir Giles Scott, a, fame, a, a then famous British architect, he is also known for designing the famous telephone cells, telephone cabins, right in, across St. Paul's, which till the day today remains the most important building in a city which is more and more surrounded by cheap architectures. Just a second, I have to change it. Was Pierre de Moron calling me? <laughs> um, <clears throat> So you can see here before the intervention that this building being so monumental, surrounded by mediocre neighborhood, but totally inaccessible. And now the bridge by Foster, the building, the museum, which is now creating a neighborhood which is growing, 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 and this has become the most visited museum in the world for modern and contemporary art more than five million every year, double as much as the Museum of Modern Art, for instance, in New York. So from hidden away, totally changed the psychology of the neighborhood, of the building, to a totally open platform for everybody. This was also perhaps the most important um, desafio, uh, the, the challenge to... to uh, <laughs> To, to make it really, to make it really um, something for everybody, so that you go there with a friend, maybe just to drink a coffee or to use the park around it, which is, of course, something you couldn't do in Switzerland because nobody would sit on the grass, but in England. So you have to bring, you have to open it in a way that people also like it, even if they are not attracted only by art. Inside, the building was like this. When we found it, it was an industrial building. The architect, you could see that the will of the architect was already then to make it more than just an industrial building. He wanted this building to be monumental, important, like a cathedral. And we, talking about reuse, not only the structure was for us, interesting for us, but the intention of the architect we somehow reused the intention of the architect in that we were digging out everything and made it even more monumental. We increased the existing given. All the other architects that were invented uh, to do the competition, we were at that time the youngest and least known from uh, all the, the list or more or less least known uh, they destroyed a lot of the existing building. We didn't destroy anything. We just dig out and go down on the very ground. The existing level was outside and we wanted to dig out everything so we would see the entire structure and not create a sotano and the upper part. You can see that here. This is the given street level. And we went down so that once you're inside, you would see all of what will be a museum. That was the former boiler house, that was the former switch house, and that is the turbine hall that became one of the most famous public spaces, not only in England. 
that was then, of course, not filled with turbines and machines, but with art. And it became, indeed, the popular space that we hoped it would become, but of course we couldn't know to which degree the English uh, and the foreign tourists would use and populate that space. It became a popular space, as I said, for people who just want to go there and meet, but also a challenge for artists to create works of art that they wouldn't do or wouldn't have been able to do in any other museum space. The Turbine Hall invented a new kind of gallery type, which was uh, attracting people, of course, but also um, giving artists unexpected, um, unexpected challenges. As here, you can see um, this huge installation by um, Anish Kapoor uh, on the ramp that has a tectonic, um, is a kind of a tectonic uh, element, or the, su the sun project by Olafur Eliasson. This kind of artwork, which is of course very attractive, um, but also opens up new dimensions in uh, how art can be. Um, brought into cities and bring and interest other layers of the population is certainly one of the great merits of the Tate as an institution. So the Tate as an institution grew through this building as much as we as architects could learn from this experience of reusing and taking a benefit of when you use it. We were not working against the building, but we used the building to do something that we as architects could never have done. We could never have invented such a space which would give artists, like here Salcedo, a Spanish, um, a Spanish architect, um, artist, um, give this um, opportunity to do life installations of such a dimension. But also in the more classical galleries that we, um, that we built in this building, like this one here, has a dimension, a scale, and a robustness that would have been difficult to find before in England. England, in fact, did not have any modern art museum before the Tate. England was never really a place for modern art, but it became it through Tate Modern. England was very much, let's say, um, reclined to its, own, um, to its own traditions of painting and especially sculpture and far less open to contemporary and modern uh, works of art. And maybe the Brexit will um, again push back Britain into a kind of a more isolated uh, country, maybe also for the arts. So in that respect, the Tate um, and especially Tate the expansion project that I will also show is one of the, of the monuments of England being part of a much more open and wider market, also art market. This is just to show you that the diversity of galleries that we wanted to bring in this reused building. This here with this very ephemeral light Zenithal light is, is right under the light beam. So we use the building like a topography which offers different types of galleries. The top one with this very ephemeral light, the turbine hall in its huge gigantic dimension before the one with the side windows where we use the existing, pre-existing windows to give a more traditional way uh, out from the galleries. And of course, views from balconies into the turbine hall and across the city. The before mentioned ramp, which connects the existing street level with the pre existing lowest level of the um, former power station, gives access, is one of the main accesses. Here, this is a moment where phase two does not yet exist. But you can see that this monument of brick, we even added brick, we wanted to make what we found even more powerful, more strong. 
This section shows the addition, the second phase. It shows again the turbine hall and the boiler house. And it again shows how important it was to dig out this lowest level. So it connects over to this area, which was also pre-existing. This is the area of the former oil tanks, from where we then, in contrast to the pr first uh, scheme, which has a more linear organization, we display the more freer organization across the phase two. So phase one and phase two are very important in two things. First of all, they are making one organism and not one and two in that the architectural ingredients, concrete and brick, remain the same. But the spatial sequence is different. One is more linear and more traditional, the other is freer and more organic. Again, we start from a given space, which is a strong foundation, the oil tank area, from where then this stair winds its way up through the building. We wanted to turn these oil tank area into galleries for performing arts and video arts that also no other museum would have in the world, that found space, industrial spaces, rough spaces are now a big thing everywhere, but very few buildings have the potential to find it on their own ground. This is how the tanks looked like before, and this is after the intervention for, for instance, this display here, which is a music and the dance performance, but also uh, other, another, the other oil tank has a different structure. We had to fix the ceiling. But also here, it's rather focused on public and performance. Whereas smaller areas are used for cinema and video and um, installation art. This is the area of the oil tanks where existing structures and new structures come together and make for one thing. We penetrate, literally penetrate, the pre-existing thing with something that a non-architect would not immediately perceive as something different. But yes, if you look closely, you can see the difference. This shoots up all the forces vertically into the extension. And from where also the stair winds its way up through the building and brings you up all the way through um, the tower, which has this strange form that I will briefly talk about later. The stair is not linear, as I said, but it is like a landscape has something topographical. Uh, and sometimes the floor is slightly inclined, so people are so aware of the, that part being more like a piece of landscape between outside and the galleries. Like here, this space here has, of course, material analogies to the first phase, but spatially has a freer, um, a freer arrangement and also allows for the curators and the artists to use those in-between spaces in a slightly different way. Since the museum is so heavily visited, it is also important to create spaces like this one, which breaks down the scale and the materiality and gives people a possibility for a more intimate um, place to stay and to find people, like points, like uh, niches, like in nature if you sit under a tree and are not always exposed to the open landscape. This is also where people are being led through. So the way we bring people through the building makes them experience the building from different angles. Till they finally reach the top floor with the views, which are, of course, amazing. And if you look outside here only, you can see how London has literally dramatically changed more than any other city that I know in Europe. is surrounded by mostly ugly towers is like a sea, an ocean of towers. If you compare this to 
the mid-90s when we started the project where literally it was a kind of an innocent, uh, innocent um, silhouette. The form is rising up from the given land parcel, which has this irregular form, and reaches the top, which is a rectangular form, which is very much in line with the existing geometry of the industrial building. So we brought this form into this form, which creates this um, kind of pyramidal shape. So we maximize the envelope, we bring in program, we create voids, we create boulevards, we create structure, and we create an envelope. We had a moment when it was a glass pyramid, and it was very advanced, and we felt uneasy, we felt not good. And the very last moment, we changed it all, and it was very complicated, but we are so released, we did it, because um, for, the, for, the, for, the, um, for the sake of making the whole thing uh, one, one organism, it was very important to bring the material structure, the brickwork, which is so typical, which is so important for the gravity of the building, uh, uh, to, to make that also, to extend that also into the extension. So that was a, really a big relief. Again, this promenade through the building with gallery floors here on three levels, like here, with a bridge connecting the two sides just once. That was also a big discussion. This one connecting bridge is really interesting since it brings together the two sides of the building. That's the entrance from the plaza. You can see that now with the extension, the south and the north are connected. So we cross the turbine hall and make the turbine hall even more an important urban space. The galleries, which are offering very different um, spatial conditions, and the tower, the plan of the tower, which is getting smaller, more you get up, which contains schoolroom, education, member rooms, many public spaces. So the tower is being inhabited by everybody, literally to the very top. The bridge, which connects the two sides and offers other views uh, into the turbine hall. And the galleries in the new part which of course have a different flavor, a different atmosphere, but remain part of the same organism. The brickwork, as I said, was important for the second phase, but we wanted to alter it to give it a different flavor, and we developed this transparency, which is like lace, which is both robust and hermetic and powerful and traditional as it is ephemeral and allows for views across the building from inside out and outside in and gives the building a kind of a lightness, transparency, but still maintains uh, a solidity. These are all details how we managed to do this and how we could attach it to the very heavy concrete structure, which is like a structure of bones behind. You can also see that we flattened this structure so people wouldn't climb up in the lower part. And you can also see how we use the edge where the two sides come together to create this kind of porosity which defines or reveals also the construction behind it. It's a simple but important detail for how we use construction as part of the idea of the whole building. And the two structures side by side, and you can also see which 
something that we all, always find very important, more, let's say, the neighbors were doing glass buildings, more we became aware that we could not do a glass building. We, could do, we should do something which is an institution, which is a public building, and is not a bank or an office building or a, um, a housing scheme. It has these towers outside the Tate. Whenever you visit it, you will immediately understand what we mean, all these glass buildings which have been uh, going up in the last years as a result of the success of the Tate, as a real estate uh, bubble. The second building in this first part, I will show four projects, is this concert hall, uh, El Philharmonie, which also is based on an existing structure, which also would not be the kind of project without us, the, uh, uh, let's say, um, uh, insisting on making the existing part a very powerful ingredient. This is a building that looks older, just like also the Tate was actually built in the 60s only late 50s, early 60s, the, the, the power station, but looks like 19th century. And this is a listed building uh, from the early 60s that we liked also for its robustness and roughness. It was a um, lager house, a warehouse for chocolate, cafe, etc., etc. And was especially located in a part of the city which was port and industrial and was totally away from the traditional city of Hamburg, which was rather, is a very beautiful city, but rather flat, uh, no towers or very few, and only the church, uh, the clock towers, going beyond that height. So somehow this height is standard for Hamburg, and only because this part opens up a new chapter in the urban evolution of the city, we thought that we could do a building that would dramatically be a different scale because the traditional city of Hamburg, the Alster, being here, was its focus on itself, whereas this here opens up into a totally different urban space, much larger, much vaster, and more dealing with water and industry and the port than the the city of uh, the citizens. You can see that here. Behind is the traditional city and in the front is the water city, the Elbe city. And this is the level of the top of this existing storage building from where you can see that more or less you most of the buildings have the same height and only the clock towers, like in a medieval veduta, can be seen. And we very much like that. And we only <clears throat> went up because we, so, some, so, so to speak, the building <clears throat> opens up a new chapter in this city. This is one of the first sketches. So somehow, very soon, it was clear that we wanted to put the concert hall on top and not sink it into the building as it was planned by the developer that came to see us. We then developed it relatively fastly. That was a, after a few months, we came up with this building, this kind of conceptual design that <clears throat> we did not know whether it would have been, uh, it, whether it could be a success or not, because it was not based on a competition, but a, a, a friend of us came up and said, instead of developing this in a commercial way, there was a project that was on the verge of being built, a tower and um, some loft transformations as a ubiquitous project, uh, as it could be in any other port city. We came up with this design, and it was winning a lot of attention with the, with the newspapers. And this title says, because it was politically not yet accepted, everybody, we, we have volunteered, we want it. We want it, and the pressure was so big on the mayor and the politicians that it created a kind of enthusiasm in the media that supported that project. So the interesting thing why I say this is that this is 
an elitist project, a concert hall, a philharmonic hall, but it was supported by the people. The people wanted it. It's not some rich person who donates it and then maybe they like it, they don't, but the people said, we're volunteer. And at the same time, the same media, a few months later, said this, because it became, uh, people became aware through media reports and through official numbers that the originally fixed price or the original communicated price was far more, was going beyond time and money, was a real disaster. And it was worse and worse. And at the end, it was around six or seven hundred. But this is like a story in itself. But I think it's important to mention it in an architectural presentation that today as an architect, if you're involving yourself in big public projects, this is not just you make a nice design and it's good or it's less good, but it's so heavily political and in a democracy and in a bottom-up democratic city as Hamburg, you cannot not expose yourself to such a debate. And it's very important that architects who do such projects are well structured in how they process, how they deal with these things to make contracts are v is more and more very, very complicated. And to do contracts especially which make you survive after a project are very complicated. Um, anyway, we survived it and the project became a huge success as you may know. Um, despite this huge battle and the building was really, the project was really on the verge of not being built, half finished, because of the financial and time uh, disaster. Now I explain briefly in which way we use it, the existing and the existing and the new are in a dialogue. The first element that we introduced in this plinth which we transformed into a silo in a lager house, in a warehouse for cars instead of chocolate beans, is this kind of um, escalator. We, as I said, we transformed the, the warehouse into a garage with the same robust type kind of architecture, which expresses, being expressed also at the outside in a relatively unchanged envelope with this entrance where we cut away some of the sockets so that people would walk in very easily and then find the escalator which brings them up through this plinth into the main building. You can see that the escalator is slightly curved. Why did we do this? We wanted to make this transition from the street to the building a, a ride into not an unknown but a somehow um, undisclosed part. We wanted to make, to express this transition in a spatial way, in an architectural way. So we want to slightly curve it, to bend the stair that brings people up so that, as you can see here, you don't see exactly where you land. And this is true for everybody that finally they reach the balcony from where they have a view through an existing window onto the waters outside and the plaza. This is the plaza level which is the former roof of the existing plinth which is of course using the same brick as for the facade. You can see where the escalator is landing and from where then you have views across the port but also on the city. And from this level, the way leads you up into the foyer spaces. On this level, it has, of course, maybe I can quickly go out here. that you find yourself on this platform from where the way then leads you up 
into the uh, foyer that surrounds uh, the main concert hall. You can also see that it has apartments and hotels around uh, the concert hall. I especially talk about that plinth, about the escalator, about the plaza, and then about the foyer and finish with the main hall. Which starts here, and you can see here that this space that is around it is in contrast to the escalator, which is a very clear one form that you can have in your mind as an architect, and then you technically draw it up and resolve it. You can also develop this relatively straightforwardly. You can also, even the, the main concert hall is one kind of a sculptural piece that follows a plan. Whereas this space in between has a different metho methodolo methodology for, as an architect. Here we were, we were forced to work very analogically, like um, bricolage, like uh, you work, uh, have been working always as an architect in that you change, you cut out, you fix it again, so very traditionally. I like this model very much because it demonstrates this working method. This is a non-digital kind of working method. You could not design that space purely on the computer. You would totally go wrong. You cannot imagine this space because you don't have any distance. And it's also much faster to do it this way. We changed it many, many ways, many times, so that finally we could test every proportion and every cut that is leading people the way up, that is detaching or connecting. This with the main core, this here is the outer form, the outer skin, the outer shell of the concert hall. I think it's perhaps also the most successful space in the whole building because you, could, you cannot show this in slides because every, every time that you walk up and down, you have really different spatial conditions. It's again a bit what I said about the Tate. We wanted to have spaces which are very tall and we want to create spaces which offer you much intimacy. And everybody who visits the building can find his or her preferred part. Always this is being used to find the way into the main concert hall. Like here, you come from the foyer into the main concert hall. And then also here, you have this kind of lower scale niche kind of things before you then enter your specific balcony. You can already see here the crust that is attached to the wall, which is yeso, which is gypsum. And it is like a shell of a sea animal. And it is also repeating the form that you see, we see outside. So it's a kind of a self-similar form that is purely driven by acoustic reasons. Each of the, these forms is here to focus the sound uh, according uh, a pattern. The main concert hall, these are all studies. How do we do this? What were our references? Talking about reuse. What is a philharmonic hall? We all know the Berlin example, the Sharoun building, which is still perhaps the most perfect model that we, of course, didn't want to copy or didn't want to take as a model because all the models that uh, all the um, architectures that use Sharoun as a model were at the end of the day less good. And why? Because the Sharoun building is in itself already perfect. So we wanted to have other, other influences. We wanted other sources that would make, that would give this philharmonic hall, this concert hall, a, a, a very powerful original um, character. One is 
the Greek theatre, the antique Greek theatre. Why? Because it's so simple and because it is carved out of the ground. So somehow, even if we are in the air, this moment of being rooted and connect the space with its materiality, its, its built materiality, uh, was very important. That's why the acoustic crust that I showed you has a very physical component, uh, very decorative, but at the same time something which is almost has a tectonic quality. So we find a lot of, of interest in this kind of foundation. But we also like this very urban and very vertical dimension of the Scala. I think this is a fantastic that the spectators themselves are a kind of a space-making element, like in a soccer stadium. As you know that we, we've also done football stadiums and we always wanted the people to be as close as possible uh, near the scene, near the actors, near the musicians in this case, so the people would be a much more interesting spatial element than any architectural feature. The third element that we like is, of course, the tent-like uh, festive kind of uh, character that is expressed in this uh, um, 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 image here from... Um, uh, um, Bayreuth, um, which is a very German, very um, Wagnerian kind of a, um, concept that we think is interesting because most of the philharmonic halls, if you look at, this, at the ceiling, the architect seems to have lost the inspiration and very often the ceiling has something technical and many chandeliers sort of not, not finish the space uh, at the very top. The very top here is very interesting because I guess this has also acoustic functions but especially it, it gives those people, if you think back of the Greek theatre, it gives these people that sit down on the ground, they're in touch with the ground, something at the top which has an equivalent but more ethereal kind of a character. This is a model that is, was made to test acoustics with Pierre and Askan uh, who were working together on this project with me. Uh, we tested here in the center, there was a microphone and the interesting thing for you here is that if you test the space acoustically, you can scale down a space and the sound that you bring into this reduced space is can be tested equally, so you can scale down the, 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 the sound as much, you can, as, much as you can scale down a space. <clears throat> and what you can see here is the finished space. And after, of course, many um, changes we've done, we wanted, as I said, to make the people surround the space. But we, of course, didn't want to make them surround it like in the Scala, in the regular way, but in an irregular, more dynamic way. On the other hand, we didn't want to make this dynamic too much going in like a spiral in one direction, but it goes in two di directions. As soon as you go somewhere, it loses itself and you go, it goes in the other direction. So it has a dynamic but also a static function at the same time. At the end of the day, the result is something where you can find your way all the way down. You can walk through the whole space all over, but it's not obvious and it was not so easy to make that work so it's not unstable or too dynamic. You can see the surfaces here. We all use them for this acoustic measurements. Also, the old concert halls that you may have seen with these Baroque ornaments, the, the, the gypsum, the yeso, has a very powerful way to support the, uh, the way acoustic flows in the space. Our solution for the roof is this huge mushroom-like chandelier that can be brought up and down 
that is at the same time a chandelier for light, but also uh, regulates acoustics. And originally we planned to even bring people uh, into that space. But you can see that the way that people can go very high up and al almost mix themselves with the technical installation at the very top. So literally the ideal was to make people surround literally the whole space. Here you can see that uh, it has different scales because we were given a pattern by the acoustician. Um, Toyota, who is a very famous Japanese acoustician, and we also created transparent versions so we would make the whole space one thing. Also, I think what is worth mentioning is how we integrate the organ into the main hall. These are samples of those gypsum boards and how the construction of this mushroom-like piece out of this central hole. <coughs> this is, of course, uh, digitally produced. And you can see that at the opening, Mrs. Merkel also liked it very much. That's where you can see how the organ is, is integrated in the main space. We didn't want to make it a central piece that would dominate or a hierarchy, too much of a hierarchy in, in the space, which very often the organ is. Here you can see what I mentioned before, that it has, of course, a symmetry, but the symmetry is not so obvious. From outside, this piece is glass, but it's not uh, like the office towers around. It has, is bulging. It has a, um, 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 a moving surface, which is cut vertically or horizontally according to the use as a window in a hotel or a balcony in the part where people have apartments. We also repeat this dancing form. This is remindful of waves or of uh, movement uh, of any kind, but also, of course, has a very strong structural component. We take that, those lines to literally support the roof that you see inside. So there is a connection between the form inside and the form outside. Those pill-like elements uh, we chose them because they allow more easily to be ar arranged within these very irregular forms. Those are cuts which bring daylight into the part between the main central music hall and the layers around which are housing and hotel. This is what I said before. Of course, we did many of those drawings and models which are testing the or optimizing the structural lines. <clears throat> we, <clears throat> of course, with this glass uh, on top of this brick um, plinth, this is in a traditional way a kind of a dialectic opposition, but um, each, you know, they are penetrating each other, as I showed with the materiality and also the spatial uh, continuity. And what you can see here is that the appearance of the building uh, looking very differently at different seasons and different uh, hours of the day, this is certainly something we like in architecture to confront people in a city with their main buildings in an each time slightly differently looking building. So this building has sometimes very dark appearance, sometimes very light, sometimes it's very clearly, see, uh, can be seen very clearly as an object, and sometimes it even vanishes, uh, which may have a kind of a romantic roots, uh, which I would not deny, but this change in how something appears uh, is certainly a very important um, obsession we follow in our work. And you can see here, of course, in making the surface so irregular, you enhance all these, these 
processes of changing appearance, which is inherent in glass, but much more so with this kind of surface. And I like this also for that very reason. This has a very romantic um, um, look, but this is a real image uh, and not a fake. So it has a, almost a, a kind of a Turner-like uh, aspect. When we speak about reuse, it's not just uh, literally reusing something material that exists or pre-exists, but also that we rediscover forms uh, that have been forgotten, like uh, the archaic house form. As you may know, we've done it and we've used it many times, but in a very uh, powerful way, I guess, in the, for this pro uh, project in Berlin, which I will briefly present. Uh, the com we won the competition a year ago, and we will now, in these months, start the Anteproyecto, the project which takes it further, after many debates, and I will assist another one uh, this Wednesday, so tomorrow, actually, uh, no, the day, no, tomorrow evening, um, because, of course, the proposal has been seen as a polemic, which, of course, it is not, but, of course, it's a provocation. Sometimes to use something which is so obvious and so simple is something that offends people. A brief history of the site. This is the Berlin area, that's the Tiergarten, for those who are a little, little bit um, um, knowledgeable about Berlin, Landwehrkanal, and that's the famous Matthäuskirche, Matthäuskirche, and that's where now the Mies van der Rohe building is and the Scharoun building in a formerly uh, totally um, classical blockrand kind of uh, city situation. The war has changed everything. That was around 1920, Matthew, uh, Matthew Church, um, a brick church, uh, then the Nazis planned to destroy some of this area in that they bring in uh, Germania, uh, a, a main axis um, for um, their um, empire, eternal empire, that gladly did never happen. But they started already to destroy some of that area. So they have built this building so part of the neighborhood was destroyed even before it was bombed out by the Allies in um, uh, 1944 and 1945, I think. So this is, that's the first building of the Nazis in, that was in, in uh, invading already this kind of pre-existing neighborhood. And the church, after the bombing, and after the reconstruction. And the dream of the Berliners was to create their own cultural forum since the, the um, segregation or the separation or the division of the city between East and West. Uh, the cultural forum, the cultural center was in the East on the museum's insel, and so the plan was to create their own uh, cultural forum. And Sharoun was one of the main um, actors, not only as an architect, but also as an urbanist, and the dream of something that would be totally against um, uh, the classical city in a freer dancing form was certainly interesting and logical and also psychologically logical, but of course also created a huge fuss and a huge disorder, because as much as Sharoun, uh, as Mies, did uh, suddenly a nice building, and Sharoun, all these objects are totally autistic. They are totally s remaining in themselves without any dialogue to the outside or to the neighbors. Whoever has visited this, this is a main gesture for, that Mies did, but all the galleries are hidden in the ground. And this place, which has the potential, potentially is open, and the forum, Nobody is ever there. And the same thing is actually also true for this kind of very interesting architecture. It is interesting spatially, but you can see all this, this, uh, this kind of stuff here. 
doesn't allow for people to go outside, to be in contact with somebody. It's not really uh, an architecture that was made or was intended to go outside the institution. The institutions also are not really in touch with each other. So the dream of the cultural forum as a place where people would come together, speak, be in touch, as I tried to explain with the turbine hall, is actually not existing. Plus, it has this big street, this kind of uh, highway crossing uh, the city that cuts apart the library and that side. So the street passes by here. Sharoun himself made a proposal for the space between the National Gallery and the Philharmonic Hall. So with this uh, building, I don't know how good this building would have been, he at least said, yes, this site can be built because that's where the competition proposal uh, uh, is made. That's where the museum of the 20th, 20th and 21st century, our design will go. So it will fill out the gap between all these buildings because there were other buildings that have been added, not only the National Gallery and the um, Music Hall, but also here, this whole part was built with galleries and museums after quite mediocre designs that were never really realized. But you can see that the spirit of Sharoun has not only had good influences. And that was a whole line proposal that turned the back to the east, because at that time, that was before the fall of the wall, that was meant to be the kind of a back or the end of um, space rather than the center. Again, Holain, and a competition for the center, a garden, a landscape concept, which of course will be destroyed if we do the museum, because this concept was of course never realized, but it was, I just show it as part of demonstrating the uncertainty or the debate around this area. That is because, of course, Mies and Sharoun are being considered as heroes and very important um, icons, which they are, but it's also making people blind for what actually the potential is of this site and the necessity to bring these things together. That's another proposal of, uh, I think, Klaihus, which is trying to connect the museums behind with this area. So that's a proposal for this site between Mies and Sharoun. But you can see already on this design how mediocre these designs are and how difficult it is to be between the purity of Mies and the playfulness of Sharoun with an, a typology that survives and exists without being rivaling or at the same time, be, be without also being totally uh, uh, too, too modest and too undecided. So the challenge to do something here is really very difficult, and the result of the competition was demonstrating how many architects just went underground. Some copied Mies, some copied Sharoun, some tried something else, but to create uh, something uh, that has its own identity and somehow becomes part of this game of individual objects was the real uh, desafio. And here, here is the site. Here is the site for, that was given to the competitors. And for us, it was very clear from the beginning, very soon, that only this very simple house form could be a sovereign form and at the same time, very simple and not a form that would rival, that would be Miesian or would be Sharunian, but at the same time has an openness. And I explained it also in a text that um, tries to give the jury a guideline what this could be and how, in fact, open the form is. And the interesting thing of this house form is that it's so powerful, symbolic, in the mind of people. Everybody 
immediately has an approach to this form, and at the same time, it can be uh, it can be very important buildings, as it can be very modest and and low key kind of uh, places. Anyway, I don't ask you to read all this, but I give you examples that we also show to the to the um, jury. In fact, the proportion of our building is exactly that. We just cut away this. So we took, in fact, exactly that. The jury just didn't know that. This is the first National Gallery. That's the National Gallery before Mies did his building, which, and I explained this in the text, the purity of Mies cannot be made more. And the playfulness of Sharoon, not even Gary, could do something that would survive next to Sharoon because it's two models that <clears throat> express an extreme. So somehow going back historically or going beyond this kind of typology was our approach. And we found this temple-like structure by Stulo is a, is a pupil of, um, of Schinkel. Or then this factory or this um, barn outside Berlin uh, is also an ingredient because we said these are not just models, but what we like is also the content. We like the museum to be like a temple, but we also like it to be like a farm, like a farm. So it is producing something. It's also feeding. Museums are producing and feeding. They are also places to have a kind of a spiritual moment. They also are placing, like I found this image when I last was in Moscow. Um, this is the manege, it was the places for horses. Now they turned it into a museum, so somehow they did what we do in Berlin. This also is in scale and proportion quite similar to what we propose. We also like the hangar aspect of it, or the train aspect of it, the openness and the transitional moment. And of course, we've used it ourselves. In the case of the Paris Museum, uh, we've used it in a more barn-like surrounding, but also we've tested it as places for galleries and for public spaces. And we've tested it as a possibility, and that's very much what we do in Berlin, as places where you can sit outside, where you can have, from the beginning, a being in touch with the building, in touch with the neighbor. We have done this house, as you may know, uh, which looks very simple and very innocent, but in fact, when you look at it from another side, you discover that it is in fact not sitting on the ground, not so innocent, but has other sides. So we like in the archaic form the subversive moment the archaic form also has. The archaic form is not just tranquil or is not just quiet, but it opens up, it opens up spaces and potentials that we are interested in as architects. We used it also as a material, powerful material, um, exercise or ingredient as part of a larger architecture, like in this case for the Schaulager, as a space, as a transitional space, and as an object of orientation. Since the beginning, we knew that we wanted also not only this form, this house form, but we wanted to make it a kind of a cross thing between existing buildings here would be Mies and Sharoon and the galleries in the north and the library. So it would be a place where you would walk through, where you would meet, where you'd find other people. We've made it, that's the very first model, that of course would, would have been, we would have been kicked out immediately because it was far too high. But we liked at the beginning the, the house form just as a roof on the which then you would organize different forms. We then later come, came back and made it lower, and we made it much integrated. But we oriented it first in a different way, towards the street, and only later we reoriented it so that it would be open to Mies and to Sharon. 
That's an earlier model. And that's what the rendering shows. We will not do this curve, by the way. It shows also a translucency a blit, uh, out, made out of bricks, very similar to the Tate, which probably we will not do, but we like the lumin luminosity from inside out and also the fact that it assimilates um, light from outside in. This is an example of the Tate that we've seen before. And inside, you can see that here too, we have in a smaller scale, we have a public central space that is composed of different elements, like this stair that brings people down from the street, which at the same time is a kind of an auditorium, that then connects down. We also like the fact that all is visible, the lowest floor, the main floor, the top floor, and the outside. Everything comes together in this central space. We want this to be a real forum for the different institutions that surround the building. This is an example of Miami Art Museum where we use the stair in a similar way as a main access element but also as an auditorium. And of course the Tate which does the same thing. So we try to give that space in the center of the Berlin Museum a similar character. We also like the galleries to have different conditions under the, under the ceiling, living with daylight from the top or with artificial light. To have galleries which have a defined and a less defined um, spatial sequence, so going out and you know, being in between spaces, so it's not a fixed frame of galleries and with the views outside and with niches and the lowest floor which connects over to me, you know, to make it not just a corridor but to make it a, a promenade for art and for different kinds of spaces, sunken spaces, like this is a, a kind of a space that is made uh, will be made to house uh, Joseph Beuys, das Kapital. Not dissimilar to the oil tank area or the Schaulager in Basel, where this installation, this permanent installation, is one of these examples where a museum has permanent spaces which are too difficult to move and which give each museum a kind of, um, or give in museums, create kind of chapel-like areas where you would always find uh, something not dissimilar to uh, religious places, like this famous installation by Bob Gober. And where you would also, like in the Schaulager, see down onto the lowest floor so that each floor would be having equal importance. and spaces outside that really are made to, which are acogedor, como se diría en español, like here. And I think this moment of, of acogedor is, very, is a very good word for what we wanna, wanna do in buildings and use the form of the building to create that. Like here is again uh, the Parish Museum in New York where this area of the benches makes sense because it, it offers people a contact to the landscape, which can be a park. This is Berlin, where you can sit, where you can be in touch with the surrounding landscape or with the surrounding buildings. And I mention especially this church because the interesting thing about this <coughs> church is not just a nice monument, but it is not used for religious ceremonies anymore, but it's a so-called open church, and, um, which sits here. It sits in a park-like area, which, as this is our plan for the landscape, where the Tiergarten somehow extends back to the Landwehrkanal, <clears throat> even if it's far less dense because it has so many buildings, but it has trees which invade the built area, not dissimilar to this earlier plan where you can see that the trees become fewer but they have the kind of Tiergarten 
extends till the Landwehr Canal, invading also the church. That's what we try to do in all these areas, a bit like here, but also around the church. And the church should be an important ingredient for this encounter because this is when I visited the church and I found in a totally unexpected way a, the most radical contemporary art exhibition by Gilbert and George, very polemic British artists. <clears throat> and to find this art in the former religious um, space on a Sunday where at the same time there was a concert uh, as you can see here, just two or three musicians in this space. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> while you were watching uh, the um, artworks uh, in this uh, formerly religious context, it was a very interesting art experience, and especially a kind of a contemporary art experience that we believe is a in very interesting way to show how the museum in the future can work, especially the one, uh, one that calls itself Museum of the 20th and 21st century. Now, the last project is um, about reuse of waste, rainwater, and earth. It's a project uh, that we have been working on since two years, a radical project, I would say, for the Berg Grün Institute in Los Angeles. It is an amazing site right, behi right behind the, um, uh, the Getty Center here. It is um, on Sepulveda Boulevard. It's in the hills of um, Los Angeles on this mount mountain um, ridge here. In fact, it is two ridges, but we mainly occupy this one. And you come up from this other side. Los Angeles is here in the back. Um, from Sepulveda uh, Highway. And this is what we will do. So we occupy the whole ridge uh, in different sequences. You come up here, and on one side, you will then, in the center, you will have the institute, but you will namely arrive in the scholar's village, and at the end, here you find the chairman's residence. And I will briefly explain how this kind of reuse extends into all these parts. It's a relatively dry area which is affected by drought, which makes it very important for us to, as Europeans, namely to say, hey, water is a key thing. How could we bring in gardens not using water from the tap? How can we bring energy up there in a climate where there's so much sun? How can we bring in something which is sustainable without falling in the trap of this kind of normal sustainability discussion? We also <clears throat> had uh, references that we liked very much for the gardens because, of course, the Arabs knew how to do gardens that would um, uh, do that, which would collect water. And especially what we like in in, uh, in uh, uh, Arab gardens and in gardens in the past is that, and I think that's a key message here, the form, the symbol, and the structural func functional um, givens have to go together. It, it would be useless to design something and then to feed it with kind of, or to hold it in place with kind of structure and with ecology discussions. So the infrastructure is like a bone that supports the form and vice versa. The water is being collected. The monastery is the, uh, now I made the jump. Uh, so that's true for the, for, the, for the garden and the water collection. And I will come back to that when I explain the scholar's village. The other ingredient uh, that we found very important for the institute part is the monastery. The client said he wants something uh, for his institute, which is an institute, you have to imagine, about um, politics, um, agency, um, peace, democracy, 
um, how could countries be organized in the future? Is one of these institutes where these issues are being discussed, whether it will be fruitful and helpful is another question, but it's a place where uh, this kind of, um, uh, this kind of um, very urgent matters um, have a very professional um, side and uh, many scholars, professors, students will permanently and semi-permanently be installed there. That's why the monastery comes from the client as a kind of inspiration he wanted to bring to that side. So this idea, this form of collectivity is at the center of uh, the project. Another thing is the water tanks. We said we don't, we are, we refuse to use the huge amount of water that he needs for his gardens uh, without making a whole infrastructure of water collection. And so we like these kind of water tanks and especially, of course, the sphere because I had the sphere in my mind for a different reason because I wanted to, besides the monastery, to have a sphere as kind of a one iconic element, which would be, of course, iconic, but not in a traditional or symbolic way without having a true a sense or a true um, a functional background. So we, at the end, used two, two spheres. One is simply a water tank, so it's almost in a pop art way that we use it because it's a found form that we bring onto the, the site for the simple reason that it collects the water at the highest point and brings it down with enough pressure so we don't need tap water. Of course it has other water tanks, you will see that later. But also I was, we were always attracted by the sphere as a pure form, as a spiritual form. And the sphere has these different sides. It has something almost stupid, banal, and something perfect. It's so perfect, you can see that on this sculpture. It's so perfect because as it was always attractive also for uh, the 18th century, for the, when the absolutistic power was finding form in especially France, but also in Spain and Italy, um, but the sphere being the most perfect form is what we were fascinated for a long time but never found a way to deal with it. And it is indeed difficult to find a reason to use it which also allows you to be so pure. Because, of course, spheres have been interesting for Boulet, Le Duc, Le Duc uh, for many architectural generations, also for um, Buckminster Fuller. But we wanted to find a different way. We wanted to keep its perfect perfection without giving it any effort of... Um, and in a kind of an effortless way. We didn't want to reveal any structure or any um, sign of, of um, structural intervention in its most purest, innocent form. We also like this purity here, but especially like the smartness in Versailles and other uh, places. We like the mixture between geometry and nature, that some of this is brought back to this uh, mountain ridge. You can see here the scholar's village in the center from where the street, you wind up your way and you land in the central part, and then you find the, uh, the institute on one end and the, and the residence on the other end. All these areas are heavily gardened and the gardens are inspired, as I said, by the sunken gardens that we found in the Alhambra and other places. And especially we like the fact that this plant reveals it. What is blue is, of course, not a water basin that shows open waters, but they are collecting waters. You can see the main tank for, which is bringing water under pressure down into the institute. But all these other places are sometimes flooded in the year, but otherwise are sunken gardens. And there's a complicated system of collecting waters that is giving the shape to, these, uh, to this whole neighborhood, including the residence here, which is 
in three bands, a gatehouse, a main residence, and the children's pavilion. The Skala village, we arrive here from Sepulveda area, and then it has a main boulevard, and the buildings are actually as objects, not really visible. It's just a garden landscape and sunken, sunken uh, gardens where the plants, I know the first thing is, sorry, before I explain that, uh, the first element before we explain the water is the waste, the energy. We discovered that there is a huge energy um, hidden in a waste deposit on that side. This here, which seems so natural, is in fact, part of this was refilled in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and contains a huge um, uh, deposit of methane that is being uh, released during the year and which goes just in the air as CO2. And our concept is now to suck out this methane and use it in the next 30 years. Uh, it can feed the whole uh, energy consumption of the, of the um, whole uh, area. That's the, the landfill emitting methane. And I don't want to explain all the diagrams, but I just mentioned this, that the kind of reuse of something which in fact was made to, to um, destroy the landscape and to hardly refill it will be landscape, but at the same time we use uh, its energetic um, potential. The second reuse, as I said, is the water, and it explains also quite uh, impressively how uh, we collect with all these basins, we collect the water that comes down and we can calculate quite precisely that we can collect even more than we need and can supply some of the water to the neighbors. Of course, this is a question of how much uh, the client is willing to in invest in the infrastructure. But all this is, in fact, an infrastructural form. It is a symbolic form, but it is also a functional form. This is the chairman's residence with these three layers, again with the kind of water supply that is being fed from this central collecting basins. Uh, I will just briefly show some images of what we try to do, this kind of um, system of clusters and loft and cave-like typology. Uh, this is the children's wing children's wing, which will be built, or basically we use only concrete and especially earth from the place. Some of the refill will be used to build those structures. And the main house with its huge uh, rooftop, which um, you can see here, you enter through a patio, you go up the roof. Uh, this is a place where the client, of course, welcomes his, uh, his uh, friends from all over the world and professors when there is, a, uh, in the institute, um, um, uh, an event. He will certainly, some of the, client, for, of the guests will also use his own place. He's also uh, aficionado del cine, so he will um, project uh, films. Uh, this is Los Angeles in the background. Um, finally, the Scholar Village is defined by these sunken gardens and by these very simple structures um, that in the section is like this, following the gravity of the water being collected by these sunken gardens, which are flood every once in a while, and the plants, the vegetation is made in order to uh, support this whole concept. So the plants is not just uh, made there to smell, which is also true here, and to give all these different sensual exper experiences, but also uh, will be carefully selected to um, support this, um, this uh, to fight the drought. That's the main way through this scholar village into the sunken parts where the scholars live which is basically almost no architecture as a, let's say, a form, 
in contrast to the house form before, or the sphere before, this is a kind of a non-form kind of architecture, basically defined by patios, vegetation, and material. Like this is an example of the ricola, the herb um, um, storage, where we tested for the first time uh, Adobe Earth in very large scale as you can see here, with these thin layers of cement which keep the wall from erosion. Finally, the last uh, part of the um, institute is the institute itself with this frame that is oriented, of course, according to not only views but also to not destroy or to um, dig into this uh, complicated landscape which is defined partially by protected landscape and by poisoned landscape, this kind of refill where the methane is being sucked out. And the landscape concept, which also um, follows the same um, thinking as I mentioned before. This is where you come in under the, f the, f the kind of uh, floating uh, frame, which offers the views or frees the views, and then it has a double height um, frame with, with um, school rooms and also living units and the main access. One sphere is the main auditorium and one sphere is the water tank. The water tank and the auditorium both use exactly the same form with a totally different program. One has this uh, kind of spiritual side and the other has this kind of ecological or popular side. This is from where the water is pumped up and then is being used to feed all the taps in the institute. And these are some sketches where, we show, where I show how much we were interested and also making it a, a, a huge way through how to use spheres and to then leave them untouched. We wanted to do a kind of anti-Buckminster Fuller concept where Buckminster Fuller tried everything to make it pure but structural. It's a work of engineering art and we wanted exactly not that. We wanted the, a sphere almost like a Christmas ball, like a, something that would be a pure and just cut through, almost like one of these um, um, objects that we find in the, in the universe. So we wanted to underscore its use as really um, a pure space and a pure form. Also from outside, we want to make it white, not polished, not too technical, a little powdery, but not too much. So it's very interesting also thinking of all these ingredients from the form, from the structure to the surface treatment. Whereas the other one, we had three at the beginning. We made it into two because the two are really saying what we want about this kind of opposition of the form, the aula here that is being accessed from the main floor by means of these two um, um, gates. And the piece that feeds the water that then is feeding all the elements that's an old version of the gardens. We want this part be more like exotic and jungle-like. And um, the foyer with views to the city before entering the auditorium. This is an old image. The auditorium will not have seats in a classical way. It will be all just slightly carved out of the same material. It's a kind of a one thing, kind of an object. It's more like this, but also that is already an older version of the inside. I think this is the last one. Now again, this, you see the two spheres, you see the village, and you see then further down the um, residence. Uh, well, that's, that's it.
Thank you for your attention. Pues tenemos, tenemos eh, no mucho tiempo, pero un poco de tiempo para algunas preguntas. Así que, eh, Rafael, no, 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 te tenemos aquí secuestrado. No tienes más remedio que hacer un comentario. ¿Eh? Te acerco un micrófono. Debo comenzar diciendo, si lo sé, no vengo. Realmente, pero bueno, eh, eh, es una suerte haber podido ver una presentación tan clara. Por un lado, casi debería comenzar diciendo lo mucho que me ha interesado, por no decir me ha gustado, cómo ha estado montada la la presentación, porque eh, efectivamente el concepto del reuse está tan, tan claro en la, en la Tate, tan claro en eh, lo que ha sido luego la intervención en Hamburgo, el concepto ahora, eh, por ejemplo, tan claro en el sentido de cuánto Reusar las formas arcaicas de arquitectura todavía tiene sentido. Lo he entendido menos en el último proyecto, en el proyecto del Bergruen, donde me parece que habría que hablar de otras cosas y me parece que en cierto modo distraería y llevaría a otro tipo de discusión que da entrada a cosas menos interesantes. Eh, si, si tuviera que hablar... Por ejemplo, de los dos museos, yo creo que el gran descubrimiento de la Tate, de la primera Tate, luego hablaré un poco de la segunda, es el, eh, cuánto eh, la nueva museografía ha ayudado a definir un nuevo modo de entender el arte. O sea, hay, hay un momento en que eh, los museos no son contenedores de obras de arte, sino que se han establecido como si fueran las nuevas referencias donde ese encuentro entre las masas y alguien que tiene que, que decir y que ofrecer desde los espacios de los museos a las masas, da lugar a que tengan un punto de contacto el Museo de Berlín y, y la Tate. Y eso eh, me parece que… y, y el Museo de, de Long Island. Eso me parece que a, ese, eh, a esa ayuda que la arquitectura ha proporcionado al, 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 al arte que viene. El arte que viene, el arte lo han hecho en el pasado las, los, los grandes clientes o las instituciones o el poder. Ahora, en cierto modo, los museos se han convertido en ese en encuentro para que los artistas tengan lugar a, a desplegar algunos pensamientos ligados todavía con lo que se ha entendido que es el arte. Y eso se ve muy bien tanto en el museo, tanto en la Tate como en el, en el Museo de Berlín. De, de la Tate, de, de, al margen de la Tate primera, la intervención en la Tate segunda me parece como siempre inteligente, inteligente sobre todo porque eh, con todo lo que ha ocurrido alrededor de la de Tate de, antigua, de la Tate primera, el, digamos, eh, introducir esa masa de ladrillo otra vez que se refiere a la Tate y que realmente en esa condición hasta cierto punto opaca y hermética por fuera, donde no hay más que la coincidencia en el ladrillo y la coincidencia remotamente también traída en la exposición de la referencia entre las dos torres, la, la torre construida que permite la geometría del museo y luego en el modo en que eh, se conecta y, y, en cierto modo, esa 
excrescencia de, de, de la teita antigua eh, permite la conexión y la vida y volver a pensar me parece de, muy, muy eh, atractivo otros aspectos ligados al, al manejo de lenguajes y todo eso me parece que puede eh, olvidarse ahora eh, el proyecto de, de, de eh, Hamburgo bueno, eh, no sé, había que hablar muchas, muchas cosas realmente me parece eh, en su conjunto un, vamos, un edificio absolutamente eh, logrado en el sentido de, de haber hecho coincidir los, los aspectos de, de presencia exterior con, con ese, ese sentido de, de, del espacio interior. Ese es un proyecto que me gusta más visto en, en todo su conjunto y en todo lo que representa que los aspectos concretos. O sea, te, tendría mis reservas con el interior de la sala, tendría mis reservas con, alguno, con cómo se han resuelto los aspectos exteriores, pero visto en su conjunto, el proyecto tiene esa grandeza de, de, de la invención del acceso, del de eh, relato de, de, de cómo explica lo que una arquitectura puede ser también a las gentes. O sea, en el fondo, esta sensación... De, de hacer que, que la arquitectura sirva a las gentes como gran cliente, me parece que, que eso lo logra el proyecto. El proyecto de Berlín eh, eh, me parece que muy inteligentemente ellos vuelven a la Tate, o sea, quien coja el proyecto ve que hay la invención de esa galería longitudinal donde tienen que pasar tantas cosas y, y cuánto realmente... Eh, eh, han, han, han entendido bien de, de todo lo que pasa alrededor y cuánto verdaderamente eh, es una, por un lado parece como eh, en realidad es Sarón quien me has, se resiste a que su arquitectura se vea como objetos, no la de Mies o no la iglesia o no la de ellos mismos, pero una vez que aceptan que en ese entorno los edificios tienen que vivir un poco por sí solos, Luego dentro del edificio tiene toda esta condición contingente y salvo una estructura que también está esperando montañas de gente, como la gran galería de, de la Tate. El proyecto ecológico, bueno, para más tarde. ¿eh? <risa> Muchas gracias y me alegro mucho de haber venido. ¿eh? No, no, me alegra, te agradezco mucho tus comentarios. En realidad va a ser la última, el único turno de palabra que demos. Porque, porque Jack, tiene esta tarde, Jack tiene esta tarde que seguir trabajando y entonces necesita descansar un tiempo, pero sí que quería oírlo yo, eh, comentar a los comentarios en castellano, para que lo digamos en español. Ah, no, tienes, tienes. No, no. no gracias, eh, Rafael. Eh, siempre es un placer tus comentarios y ya sabes que hablamos mucho en el pasado y seguimos hablando... Hoy mismo, esta noche, me alegro mucho y cada vez es un interesante, pero es más un comentario, no quiero comentar el comentario de Rafael. <risa> eh, lo de Bergrün yo pienso que será muy interesante, pero es más complicado. De momento se trata de reuse hasta de manera hasta más urgente, yo pienso. Um, porque lo del waste y del agua es interesante y quiero demostrarlo porque se trata de una escuela a los alumnos um, que una forma de un arquitecto tiene que ser más que una forma de placer o de, de tengo la inspiración. Las inspiraciones muchas veces son nada, pero claro, de vez en cuando hay que utilizar la inspiración para conectar justamente eh, lo necesario, lo funcional con lo no necesario, una, una bola, una esfera, no es necesario, pero es muy interesante y siempre les, interesa, eh, les interesó la, 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 esfera, la esfera a los arquitectos de todas las generaciones. Pero es verdad que casi, casi nunca ha funcionado, porque una esfera es también algo un poco estúpido, porque es tan perfecto que no se puede entrar. 
cómo, cómo hacer una ventana, una puerta, cómo mantenerla, y no he, he explicado. En nuestro caso, la última esfera es como en el billiard table, parece uh, bajar, ¿no? parece uh, desaparecer. Es, tiene un momento peligroso, tiene cosas muy arquitectónicas que, que nos interesan mucho y cada vez que hacemos un proyecto hay que verlo al final, hay que ver si funciona o no, porque lo bueno de la arquitectura, lo difícil es que son ideas, pero por fin o al final hay que funcionar y hay que funcionar siendo físico, siendo aquí presente delante del, de ti. ¿no? Ya, muchísimas gracias, gracias a todos por estar aquí, gracias a la escuela por acogernos, gracias Rafael por acompañarnos con tus comentarios. Y sobre todo, gracias Jack por tu generosidad al, al venir una vez más a esta escuela con esta conferencia bautizada. Gracias. Gracias.